Chris is going to talk on updates in diabetes management. Dr. Copper Wintergerst is a pediatric endocrinologist with Norton Children's, uh, also associated with the University of Louisville. He completed his pediatric residency at the University of Florida College of Medicine and pediatric endocrinology fellowship at Stanford University. His primary clinical and research focus is in the realm of diabetes mellitus, improving life, preventing, and ultimately curing type 1 diabetes. He is the division chief for pediatric endocrinology and director of the Wendy Novak Diabetes Center, the most comprehensive pediatric diabetes center in Kentucky, and he holds the Wendy Novak Endowed Chair of Pediatric Diabetes Care and Clinical Research. Thank you, Dr. Wintergerst, for joining us. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, are you able to uh, see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right, fantastic. So uh, good morning, everyone. I have uh, the pleasure of uh, presenting today um, diabetes management, basically an update for 2021. And so uh, I have no personal financial interests, uh, a little bit of an alert. I will uh, be presenting a little bit about products from what I call ancient times, um, from companies that, that don't exist anymore, but it provides, I think, a great um, example of how far we have come. So prior to the 1920s, uh, as probably everyone here knows, uh, a diagnosis of juvenile diabetes, now known as type 1, um, had a 100% mortality rate. Uh, really, over the millennia, only dietary management uh, was possible. In 1908, Elliot Joslin uh, published the, the first um, a comprehensive um, uh, book on self-management, and the focus was on diet and exercise, and really more effective for type 2 diabetes. Uh, but Frederick Allen in 1913 sort of built upon this to set up institutes around the country uh, to implement what uh, we call the starvation diet. Uh, literally, it's almost similar to uh, today's uh, keto diets, um, but um, temporarily effective, uh, the reduction of intake to down to 30 grams of carbohydrates uh, was really the, the only option until 1921. And so uh, we have Dr. Bantine, Best, Collip McLeod, and our brave uh, hero, Marjorie, uh, they were the first ones uh, using work that came from uh, the decades prior to successfully um, inject insulin uh, controlling glucose uh, in anyone, uh, and that was Marjorie. Uh, what they did is, is they isolated, uh, they removed the pancreas, isolated the islets, and then injected those uh, back into Marjorie. And in 1922, Leonard Thompson was the first human to be successfully treated with insulin. Although it required a little bit of purification, uh, he went on to actually to live uh, quite a few years after. Uh, that, that picture in the middle uh, shows the old uh, glass syringe. Uh, you actually had to use a whetstone to sharpen the needle at the end. And on the right-hand side is one of the original vials of insulin from the University of Toronto where, where these scientists work. Uh, a fun fact uh, is that um, the patent to insulin was sold to Eli Lilly uh, from the university for one dollar. That's crazy. Um, so uh, we move forward uh, 20 years and so we started we start advancing to using porcine and bovine insulin uh, but we still don't have an effective way to monitor glucose and then Clinitest again this is a product and a company that doesn't exist any longer. In 1941 they had this product where you would uh, collect some urine in that little tube, you drop that tablet uh, into the tube and it would range from green color to all the way to an orange color. So 0.5% glucose to 2% glucose. And patients would actually use the color change. So if it started to turn orange, they would know that they needed to take an injection. Uh, in Dextro sticks in 1965 was the first product 20 years later, the first product where we used blood. Um, so the advantage is not a lag like there is with urine. Um, they would put a drop of blood on the end of the test strip and the uh, wait a minute, uh, wipe the blood off, and then it would cause a color change because of the reagent on the strip. And then they would use a chart to estimate um, what they thought their glucose was and treat accordingly. And so this was very subjective though. And so there was an attempt made using technology. This was the first glucose meter, so to speak, uh, not quite uh, what we have today, but in 71 and 72, you have uh, this reflectance meter that used those same test strips 
uh, to try to be more objective uh, measure of how the what the glucose level looked like. Uh, and in 78, this was actually a controversial publication um, where it was the use of this technology and injections and using injections at home. Uh, this was the, the first publication to actually utilize all of this for, for home management uh, before this technology was uh, just in physician offices. So we take a, a few years step back. Uh, the first insulin pump uh, was literally a backpack by Arnold Kadesh. Uh, and so this was not a subcutaneous insulin pump and obviously not terribly discreet. Um, but the first wearable insulin pump uh, only required 10 more years before it was available. Um, but it wasn't uh, fully marketed in the US uh, and it was a yet almost another 10 years before we had the first um, mainstream programmable insulin pump that was utilized in patients. Uh, this enabled people to be able to actually program basal insulin. Uh, in between that time was a groundbreaking achievement and that was movement from porcine and bovine insulin to synthetic human insulin, uh, which removed some of the horrible uh, challenges we had with um, uh, supply. Now, the Diabetes Control and Complications trial, uh, at least for uh, diabetologists, is famous. Um, it showed that long-term near-normal glycemic control was able to have a, a significant influence on micro and mac macrovascular changes over time. And so this really drove a change in effort across the world. Um, and um, with that effort, you had to have the, uh, it, it wasn't just um, technology, it was also uh, insulin therapies had to change. And so before we were using regular insulin, uh, now we have fast acting analogs enter the market in 96 and the long acting uh, glargine in 2000. I've circled the uh, long acting insulins and on the right is a chart showing the various profiles and their length of action. Uh, the fast acting analogs are in the in black and they really kick in in about 15 minutes, peak in about an hour and most effective action in two to three hours. Um, some of the long acting insulins range from about 12 to 16 hours all the way out to 36 hours now. So we have a lot of therapeutic options. Um, the model has actually shifted in recent times. So this is uh, about five or six years ago. Um, this was laid out where there's a better understanding that there is some genetic uh, susceptibility uh, and perhaps some genes that uh, provide some degree of protection against type one diabetes. Um, there needs to be some type of environmental trigger, some trigger that influences uh, the immune system where you have T cell dysregulation and an inflammatory cascade that involves the production of these antibodies. And this is not a complete set, but GAD65 being the number one that's associated uh, eventually, the beta cell destruction leads to loss of first phase insulin response, and then ultimately uh, the diagnosis of diabetes. This has changed uh, our staging, and so we now have, this is sort of intuitive, but uh, these discrete changes um, have, are now published for uh, the staging process from the initial identification of autoimmune dysfunction all the way to stage three, which is when we all typically see patients. Um, that's in, this is important because there is a push right now as the cost of antibody testing and even genetic testing continues to improve. Um, there are discussions in uh, the government in the AAP uh, looking at this as a possible uh, public health uh, screening uh, modality to where we would identify early disease and then per perhaps uh, be able to take action. What about the phenotype? And so uh, 20 years ago when I started, uh, the phenotype was classic. Uh, you would have an emaciated appearing child with significant weight loss and all of the uh, polys that we would typically uh, associate with type one diabetes. And that's, that's no longer. Um, there is a subset of course that, that present this way, but many of the patients are of normal weight uh, are overweight or obese and um, may not even have a known history of weight loss. Uh, this has changed how we approach it. And so we want to make sure that when we have a child who presents with clear uh, evidence of diabetes, um, we want to confirm uh, the exact etiology. So we, do, we no longer take for granted that someone has type one or type two, for example. 
Uh, the ADA in recent years has also shifted uh, the diagnostic criteria to now include hemoglobin A1C. Uh, there's a little asterisk because originally this was purely for, for adults with a caution for use in children. Um, in, in pediatrics in general, this has been adopted. However, the problem with this is that an A1C is an average uh, and it does not uh, readily detect first phase loss. So uh, in patients, say for example, cystic fibrosis related diabetes, um, you need to make sure you're not utilizing the A1C as your only screening tool uh, because intervention is warranted if they lose first phase and they're spiking after each meal. And so a two hour postprandial during an OGTT is still the gold standard. And so we have long since gone from urine testing uh, now to this advanced uh, glucose meters where it's uh, a little bit faster than the six or seven minutes. Uh, it's now more like five or six seconds. Uh, and so these uh, meters are wildly varied, uh, come from dozens of companies. Uh, many of them have apps that transmit the information uh, by Bluetooth directly to the app on their phone. And most of them allow us to download uh, not just logs, but sophisticated data analytics that allow us to make a treatment choice uh, and adjustments. Um, this is inferior though to uh, the age of glucose monitoring with continuous uh, products. And so in 99, uh, the first uh, relatively rudimentary uh, device uh, came on the market. It was wired actually. Uh, and so um, we have had both non-invasive and interstitial devices. Uh, I won't talk about non-invasive today, but there have been products that have uh, gone on and off of the market. Uh, and there's, there are uh, devices that are uh, available, just not uh, FDA approved for use in children in the US right now. Uh, interstitial glucose monitoring devices measure the glucose in the interstitial fluid. And so you have some type of a sensor that is underneath the skin. It transmits that information to a transceiver. And uh, so some examples there with, uh, in the middle two pictures of different devices. And this information goes to some type of uh, remote uh, receiver. Uh, it can even go to your phone in some instances. Uh, if you have smart, uh, you have a smart watch, you can even see your glucose level on your watch. So uh, this is a, a major game changer and it has continued to evolve actually over the last 20 years. Uh, some of the devices uh, don't transmit um, until you um, uh, pull the PD PDM over. So that's just another example. Uh, the last technology, which is uh, available in Europe, uh, and you can use this up to six months, uh, in the U.S. it's up to three, and it's extending to six uh, with the current FDA hold in review. Um, but this is an implantable interstitial glucose sensor. Um, it is inserted in the office uh, with local, uh, and if this continues to move forward, we'll be doing this here. Um, although I probably should talk to Dr. Evans about that. Um, and so what it, what it is, is that the transceiver is that black device and it actually can come on and off of the skin. And so it doesn't have to stay on um, if the patient is going swimming or they're doing some activity. And then that information gets transmitted to a remote device through Bluetooth, namely your phone. So diabetes treatment has also improved, but um, we unfortunately have many patients that still use vial and syringe due to the barriers uh, with insurance coverage and affordability. Um, some of these analog insulins came out obviously more than 20 years ago, um, and the cost of them has increased 300% uh, or more. And so it has made it very challenging for many patients to afford this. Uh, insulin pen devices uh, are very handy though, and certainly improve adherence. A needle gets screwed on the end of the pen, and the pen, you then dial your dose uh, with some pens allowing as low as uh, 0.5 units. And then you just give the injection similar to the syringe. Um, the way we dose, because this is uh, valuable information to when we're communicating or a, fam a patient is uh, talking to you, uh, we do total daily dosing in general about 0.5 to one unit per kilo per day, although um, we individualize that. So that's just a, a rough range. Basal in general at the start is roughly around 20 to 40 percent of total daily dose, sometimes up to 50 percent at the start, uh, and then we modify that. Um, bolus insulin, which is given with um, meals, snacks, and if there's evidence of hypo or hyperglycemia and you're treating, um, utilize uh, various um, techniques. The insulin to carb ratio is the one we utilize and it's the most sophisticated and most accurate. 
Uh, that's one unit uh, covers a certain number of grams of carbohydrates. That's again, very individualized. And we may change that throughout the day. Sliding scales um, are the um, more of a crude way to do it. it. That's actually historically what we used to do um, a decade or more ago. Uh, and what you would do is you'd use a flat amount of insulin to cover a set amount of grams of carbohydrates at each meal. And then you would have a range scale where if the glucose landed within that, uh, those blocks, um, you would give extra insulin. Not as accurate. Uh, it also limited the patient to eating the same number of grams uh, at each meal. And so that's obviously a limitation because no one does that. Uh, fixed meal dosing is the least sophisticated um, and unfortunately the least safe. Uh, this is where an individual will not um, uh, count carbs. They will not check uh, glucose levels and um, they're just taking a certain amount of insulin at each meal. And so just be aware that those different um, plans exist and depending on which plan they're using um, uh, uh, sort of denotes a safety that we have to be more aware of. Uh, glucose correction factors. Uh, this is the insulin that we use for correcting hyperglycemia. It also is a calculation we use to subtract insulin in the event that their uh, blood sugar is below target. Um, we use one unit uh, to cover a certain amount of milligrams per deciliter of glucose. In this example, I used one to 35, greater than a target glucose of 100. And so when patients show up to your office, they should be able to express, although not necessarily using our terminology, but express these different numbers. And it gives you an idea of, uh, of how they're managing. If they don't know those numbers at all, then that's, that, that's a, a family, a patient that, that needs um, increased education or further education. So we come up with all these fancy algorithms, but, it, but it's really worthless if uh, we don't do a wonderful job of diabetes education. And um, we have a fantastic team that really uh, sets the groundwork. And so the families learn how to use different resources to understand uh, what carbohydrate, um, car carbohydrates do. Uh, they're not all created equal. They also, the more advanced patients will um, talk to you about meal composition and an understanding that the larger meal versus the smaller meal, meal may require more or less insulin um, despite a certain ratio that we have calculated. Uh, various additions to the meals, so protein fats, um, non-starchy vegetables, et cetera, also have an influence. Um, we also educate a great deal, including um, having an exercise physiologist that work with families about the influence of activity, um, mental, emotional, physical stressors, uh, so if you're sitting um, and doing homework or taking a math test or working on a work project, uh, project that will influence your blood sugar just like uh, walking your dog or playing in a soccer game. Thankfully, we have, again, technology to save the day to make this easier. And so there are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps, um, many of them free. Uh, we have a very select number that we use um, for insulin bolus calculation. Uh, and it's really handy. You, we can program the app with the patient and then they don't have to use an actual calculator. They can then plug in the carb intake and the glucose value and it gives them the insulin dose they should take. There's also apps that have uh, very large databases including local uh, fast food and sit down restaurant data uh, that families can use. Now, for those individuals that aren't interested in um, advanced pump technology uh, and want to step above what they've been doing with regular pens, the smart insulin pen is available. And so this is a, a very interesting device. Uh, it has an app that has a lot of what I just mentioned in the slide before, uh, including some integration with uh, some glucose meters and CGM technology. And then what had me completely geeking out uh, in my inner diabetes nerd uh, is that uh, panel on the far right. Um, the device actually has a temperature gauge. So if the pen gets too hot or too cold, it will literally alert the patient uh, that their insulin may no longer be viable. So pretty, pretty cool. Um, all right, so this is, uh, this is when we're getting uh, truly advanced. Um, uh, we have about 70% of our patients now that are on some type of advanced technology and many, many of them um, are now utilizing um, pumps. Uh, tubed pumps and patch pumps are the two categories. Tubed pumps uh, that you uh, put insulin inside of a cartridge within the device itself. The insulin flows through that tube into that set. 
The set has either a stainless steel needle or a hypoallergenic cannula that goes just into the interstitial space where insulin is delivered. And we program these as opposed to a half of a unit, you can literally give um, down to a hundredth or a thousandth of a unit, which is shocking to even say that out loud. Patch pumps um, also exist. The one on the left is the only one available uh, FDA approved for use in children with type one. Um, they, the patch pump does not have a tube, uh, obviously. And so um, you have to have some type of controlling device and that may look like a phone, but that is a, uh, a device that is the platform uh, to control the pump. Uh, disadvantage of, is if they leave that at home, um, they'll still get the basal insulin, but they won't be able to bolus. Uh, and then these pictures just show what it looks like um, on a person. Uh, and so up until um, recent years, um, you would utilize CGM or blood glucose meters, and then the patient had to completely um, uh, program and manage the pump by themselves. And not anymore uh, for some of our patients. And so we closed the loop in 2016. I actually did research, uh, this is my research in fellowship, uh, back in uh, 03, 06. And so it has taken this long, um, but um, truly this is another game changer. And so we now have closed loop hybrid systems. And so these are hybrid because the individual still has to um, input data and manage, but um, the algorithms within the devices transmit the information they're receiving from the glucose sensor um, to make adjustments in the basal insulin, the background insulin um, that is above or below the program settings that we have set. The two devices on the outer edge on the left and the right are FDA approved for use uh, for type one in the US uh, for kids. And so I wanted to show you a little bit of an example of uh, before and after. And so um, on the left-hand side, this is before uh, closed loop. And so if someone is not using a closed loop system, uh, we'll get a log uh, download that uh, will show um, information from their pump. Uh, the, the top line uh, with the orange uh, blocks are the glucose values that are that manually put into the pump. The black uh, little squares are the carbs. And then the bottom um, where those little ovals um, are the uh, bolus insulin. And then there's uh, this one doesn't have it, but there's usually a, a, a fourth line that has the basal profile. Um, on the right-hand side is just aggregated data for two weeks from a CGM. Um, we also get CGM data where it's daily, and of course we use that and match it up with the, the pump. Um, making very valuable adjustments, but the difference is really obvious when you look at what these closed loop hybrid systems are capable of. And so this is a single day, um, and if you look all the way at the bottom, uh, there is a little straight blue line, and that is, represents the basal program. There's a little subtle variation throughout the day, but where you see that fluctuation in the blue is when the pump program is coming online and providing some low level assistance. As the sugar level drops, it cuts off and allows the, the program to come back into, into play, and then it kicks back on again, on and off throughout the day. And you'll see there this little teardrop sort of just uh, around four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, that is where the pump itself gave a little micro bolus. Now the individual still has to put in information about carb. They still have to, to tell the pump that I'm uh, going to sleep or I'm exercising, or they still have to sometime, sometimes uh, deal with excursions. But this is like um, having one of my diabetes educators follow uh, the patient around, although they say they would definitely not want us uh, hanging out with them uh, every day. But it's, it, it, it's frankly just fantastic and providing um, yet another level of management that we're uh, able to now look forward to. Uh, the disadvantage is there are still barriers uh, to obtaining this uh, service. And uh, one thing that it does do though is it decreases the burden uh, on the patient and it does increase the burden on our staff, but we welcome that because the outcomes are amazing. We are now achieving A1Cs that are in some patients, we're able to get them into the five and sixes uh, with pump technology now. Um, this is um, what we would receive if we had someone that came into the office on the system. So on the left, we would have some form of a dashboard. Uh, and then on the right is just an example of, again, aggregated data. We have the day by day. But this aggregated data is really, really valuable to share um, with um, all of you. And so what we would do is we would look at this. If you look at the bars on the left-hand side in that green, 
you're looking at 78% of the time that patient's glucose values are between 70 and 180. Prior to closed loop systems, um, we were really, it was really difficult to push 50, 60% unless you were just a, um, a, a, a patient that really worked very, very, very hard. Um, now we're able to achieve this with obviously a lot of work still, but more routinely. And, and again, it's just fantastic. Why is this even more important? Because just what I mentioned earlier about the phenotype, uh, the phenotype is now different um, and it is reflecting the reflection of that is this what was published a couple of years ago by our T1D exchange group um, that the average A1Cs, unfortunately, in adolescence, as well as all the way out to the thir late 30s, uh, has literally gone up. Um, and so um, this new technology is quite timely. And so what you'll see now is a variation on how we, how we look at glycemic targets. Um, for years, our group at the Winnie Novak Diabetes Center has really focused on um, this time and range, and it has now been published in the American Diabetes Association Standards of Care as one of our metrics. And so individualized A1C targets are, of course, something that you'll see us talk about. Um, it is no longer everyone needs to be under 8.5%, 8%, 7.5%, um, but our goal is the lowest possible that we can get for a particular patient. Um, on the left is even more important. And so while we have these 10 different um, metrics that we follow, the most important for uh, most of you would be, um, um, what is our glycemic variability? We have a number of different um, uh, statistics that we use for this, but percent coefficient of variation is our favorite. And if we can get that patient under uh, equal to or less than 36%, that means at particular points in time, there is very little variability in their glucose level day by day. And, and that's just fantastic if you can do that. Uh, time and range, uh, our percentage, we want that time uh, for glucose values between 70 and 180 uh, to be 70% or greater. And so this is a graphic representation. You can basically ignore what's on the left. That's just the text version, um, but we like these little color bars. So we show these to our patients. Um, we want the patients to be in this green um, more than 70% of the time. Um, from a hypoglycemia standpoint, these, when patients are able to get on these closed loop systems, we're able to reduce, um, we're able to improve their A1C, increase their time and range, and all at the same time re reduce their uh, occurrence of hypoglycemia. And so we want that um, more extreme hypoglycemia to be under 1%. Um, well, how do we uh, deal with hypoglycemia now? So we have new products available here too, which is great. And so these are actually relatively new, just came out in the last year and a half to two years. Um, before, glucagon pens always had to be mixed. Um, so in an, in an emergency, uh, someone had to fumble around and do that. Uh, now there are new products on the market, and if we can obtain insurance coverage, uh, we can use this premix pen, that's the one on the right, or even a nasal powder formulation that is um, equally efficacious. And so many, many of our families are really trying uh, hard to, to move to that one, and it, it's been really helpful. Uh, and so we talked now a lot about the tools of diabetes management, but the reality is that um, the core to excellent care um, is the, the support services that we provide. So diabetes educators, dietitians, uh, our social, social service team, um, our behavioral health team, and public health. And so all of these are needed in order to be able to address all of the barriers to even utilizing a lot of the technology and therapeutic options that I've just showed today. Um, this uh, is a, a long list, not comprehensive, but I like to show it just because we, we point out some of these things where we have uh, patients that simply cannot get um, a, an insulin pen, much less a pump. Um, there are patients that we worry about teaching them carb counting, but they're worried about food security. And so, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that we have team members and uh, patient and family assistance program. Um, uh, we have our uh, food banks that are able to provide a lot of support for these families. And so the future is really uh, continuing to stay on the cutting edge. Uh, when new products become available, um, we evaluate those uh, very rapidly and we're able to adopt uh, appropriate technology into our practice um, nearly instantaneously because of uh, how talented uh, the team we've built um, is. And 
Um, what we do is we um, look to each patient and family. We identify their individual needs, what works best for them. Um, whatever works best for them, we work hard to remove those barriers, uh, help them access these advanced therapeutic options. And uh, probably the most important thing with all of this new technology, again, there is a burden on uh, the diabetes team now more than ever. Um, and so we need to stay connected with our families. And so we work hard to, to do that too. And so uh, I, we, it is, uh, it's, I, I reflect back uh, to when um, it was uh, Kelly Woodruff, um, Dr. Foster, and just a couple of us. Uh, and now we have this uh, amazing team with pharmacists, diabetes educators, dietitians, licensed clinical social workers, exercise physiologists uh, uh, to, to serve your patients. Um, our access as well, similar to cardiology, is, is uh, instant for diabetes, and we're down to uh, just a, a couple of weeks for, for endocrinology, and so uh, ready to serve uh, our community. And so on the left there is our contact, in, or, uh, our contact information for my office, uh, the fax number, and my private cell number. So if you ever have any concerns or questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wintergrosh. You did a great job leading the team. It was definitely interesting uh, hearing more about the history um, as well as just all the new technology that's out there. Um, we do have several questions, um, and some of these you may have answered, um, but maybe you want to expand on a little bit more. Are there resources available at the Novak Center uh, for pre-diabetic children aimed at preventing diabetes, such as classes and a dietitian? So, um, so that's a, a great question, yes. So the children who, uh, we do have a weight disorders clinic um, uh, that you can refer your patients to uh, if they have evidence of that stage two where uh, whether it be type one or type two diabetes that is impending, um, uh, we pull them into the diabetes clinic and we utilize both our dietitians within the practice as well as resources that are uh, both in Norton Healthcare as the organization. We have an, quite a few resources and we also refer them to local resources for um, activity such as uh, our partnership with the YMCA. Excellent, thank you. Uh, another question, in your experience, do you find insurance creating a significant access barrier to care for patients seeking newer technologies for diabetes management? Um, so, so yes, insurance, um, you know, I, I, I can say that every time a new technology comes on the market, there is a, an incredible lag, and it's somewhat similar to new um, um, medication therapies that come on the market, but technology seems to be a, a lag. They also have a tendency to create um, a barriers such as like a CGM requiring someone to test a certain number of times over the course of a month in order to get something that will make it so they don't have to test their blood sugar anymore. And so um, we work with families. We have um, a, a wonderful patient care coordinator, uh, Shanlin, who uh, works with our diabetes educators to break down those barriers. Uh, and so in many cases, um, we can do peer-to-peers and we're able to gain access. So they exist, but um, we work hard whenever possible to, to move through them. Thank you. Another question, are you seeing an increase of tra transgender males receiving testosterone being diagnosed with new onset diabetes? Um, no, within our practice, we do have some patients um, with, uh, who are transgender who also have uh, some form of diabetes, um, but we have not seen an increase um, in any way, shape or form. There is um, a, um, a trend towards uh, the, the uh, new onsets, uh, you know, the, high, the greatest peak uh, in incidence for us uh, and actually for the country is in the pubertal age group. Although the fastest growing group is uh, the toddler group, which is um, unfortunate, but um, that um, any reflection for testosterone therapy is just a, a factor uh, in play because of the age group. Um, Thank you. Um, I realize we are getting short on time, but I'm going to go ahead and pick out a few more questions. We have a lot of great questions, if that's okay with you, Dr. Wintergerst. Okay. Um, is there an association between COVID-19 infection and new onset diabetes? If so, is this long term? Uh, so, so I love this question. Um, you know, unfortunately, the short answer is we are evaluating that right now. There is um, a statistical correlation right now, but we haven't yet 
uh, connected um, the actual pathogenesis from COVID itself. Um, there have been reports, um, unfortunately, type 1 and type 2, uh, the incidence did increase in the last 18 months. In our practice, uh, we had the greatest number of diagnoses of diabetes um, in our history. Um, and so um, there is a concern that the inflammatory cascade that is caused by, uh, by the coronavirus um, may have a, a very rapid influence on the pancreas. And so um, I suppose, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, more to follow on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a couple more questions. Uh, what are your feelings on using oral medications for treatment of type 1 diabetes? Um, so there uh, currently there are no um, medications um, for the use, uh, oral medications uh, to use in, in children with type 1 diabetes. However, uh, there are a number of studies, including the ones that we are a part of uh, and are becoming a part of, where they're exploring the use of these medications as adjuncts. And so um, the problem with some of the oral meds is they increase risk for things such as um, a DKA, so uh, SGLT2s, for example. Um, those are quite effective in type 2 patients, and actually they are effective in type 1, but they can be um, dangerous, and so they have to be monitored very closely. So we are starting to explore these as adjuncts in our young adults because we see patients up to 26 years of age. And so before I move them uh, into the younger population, we need more data uh, proving their safety. Thank you. Um, one last question. Have you seen a decrease in DKA as well as ICU admissions with improvements in pumps and the closed loop hybrid systems? Um, so the, um, as far as the overall DK admissions at new onset at, at, for newly diagnosed patients, that's one of the reasons I was mentioning the staging process because unfortunately we still have uh, a significant percentage that are admitted and newly diagnosed in DKA. Um, once you're diagnosed and you're on these therapies, um, we do, we have seen an overall reduction in patients that are on closed loop systems with DK admissions, but unfortunately that there is ascertainment bias with that. And so um, more patients um, are over time, um, if you're not on a pump, you're more likely to be, uh, to go into DK, but again, ascertainment bias because patients that want to adopt that technology tend to be more engaged uh, and so um, largely, I would say that as more patients ha are able to get on it, um, we still see DK admissions. Um, but big picture, yes, it does have an influence on reducing DK. Well, thank you. Uh, another great presentation. Uh, we will take time for a lunch break.